AMD today formally announced its Zen 3 CPUs and four new SKUs for the Ryzen CPU family. These are going to be in the 5000 series of CPUs. We'll be covering the basics from what was announced in the presentation today, but we also have some additional information during the presentation. We sent off emails to AMD asking for uh, clarifying information and some additional details and specs on the processors coming out. So we'll be sharing all of that with you today. This is covering CPUs. We'll be talking about motherboard support and pricing, release dates, all that stuff for the Zen 3 Ryzen 5000 CPUs that were announced in AMD's keynote. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly's Conductonaut Liquid Metal. Conductonaut is what we've used in all of our liquid metal and D-Lit thermal tests, capable of dropping CPU thermals significantly when replacing the stock thermal interface. Lower CPU thermals don't just allow better overclocks, but also lower noise levels because the transfer efficiency is increased. The mix of gallium and indium makes for a thermal conductivity of 73 watts per meter Kelvin, outclassing traditional pastes significantly. Learn more at the link in the description below. So we'll start with the absolute basics. We have everything timestamps, but you should obviously definitely collect more information than just the big number that uh, is going to be passed around today, which is going to be the IPC uplift number. I'm not even going to say it until later because we want to get through some of the more interesting details, like why that number is what it is. So uh, starting with the basics then, AMD is planning to launch its new Ryzen 5000 series CPUs on November 5th for on-shelf availability. There will be four SKUs, it says, will all be available on the same day initially. And uh, we should also expect that reviews would likely go up on that day. That's typically how AMD has done it. Might be one day in advance, depending on how they feel. What we don't know yet is exactly what AMD's plans are for reviews and the timelines for them, but certainly we'll know soon enough. We asked the company if it has plans for additional CPUs beyond the initial four SKUs. And the current answer was technically that it has, quote, no plans for additional SKUs. Obviously, AMD's got SKUs in mind, for sure. It's not going to be a four CPU launch. But for right now, the takeaway is that AMD isn't going to talk about any other products in the CPU lineup in the immediate future, probably at least until after these launch, and then maybe some after that, sometime after that. So it's four for now. Here's the SKU list. AMD has an R9 5900X at $550. That fills in the 3900X role at a former pricing of $500 for that one, or a current pricing of about $400 after the XTs came out. The CPU is 12 core, 24 thread for the 5900X, and it has a claimed boost maximally of 4.8 gigahertz on at least one core. Although we'll need more details on the boosting behavior as uh, that's still heavily dependent on the scenario. The R7 5800X will be an eight core, 16 thread part at $450, boosting to a claimed 4.7 gigahertz and the R5 5600X is the 6-core, 12-thread part at $300, running 3.7 to 4.6 gigahertz. And that, again, that high-end number is not all-core. Uh, it's never really been all-core for a long time. There's a 1-megabyte cache reduction as well from the R7 SKU to the R5 SKU. The fourth SKU is the $800 AMD R9 5950X, which is the 3950X replacement. This CPU is a 16-core, 32-thread part that claims an up-to boost number of 4.9 gigahertz. That's still not quite the 5 gigahertz number that rumors were once again reporting leading up to launch. We saw, we saw one a couple months ago that was like, Ryzen 9, 5.65 gigahertz, question mark, exclamation point. And that was never going to be true unless it was liquid nitrogen. So probably best to, to stop... Uh, getting too hyped about frequency numbers. They were wrong for a lot of the RTX stuff too before launch. Anyway, that's the specs list right now for the four. The cache config on the 5950X, the $800 part, is 72 megabytes combined. And then we'll talk about the power in another section. We have a lot to talk about here today, specifically about some architecture changes that have been disclosed, some power changes, things like that. But one thing to get out of the way immediately is the obvious $50 price creep in the SKU listing. Uh, it, AMD appears to be very aware of this. It talked about value and value proposition and how it's perceived in the market. So it's definitely very aware and maybe a little self-conscious of the pricing. But AMD has historically competed on price and value. And the CPU world now that it has gained some of that brand credibility, it's going to start competing on quality instead. Kind of like Nvidia competes on quality and not on price and GPUs. You're likely going to see that start to shift a little bit. Uh, with the CPU world for AMD, which is not wholly a, a bad thing. So remember also that the X names versus non-X names are ultimately just names. The underlying specs of those, like with the 2600X, 3600X versus the non-X part, 1600X, 
Uh, we're all the same for the most part, except for frequency in, in those instances. So it does look like, if you look at that stack, there's clearly room for an R7 5800 or 5700X. AMD told us that it has no current plans to announce any such parts, uh, and anything that does come out later would probably be slotted in somewhere below the 5600X initially, because certainly the $200 price point is incredibly popular, like with the 3600 when it launched. So they'll likely be filling that one first and later, but we don't have any firm information on that at this time. Uh, also, if a 5800 or a 5700X came in, it would probably be at a lower frequency, obviously, and as opposed to the, the existing 5800X part, and would probably be uh, underperforming versus, say, a 5600X in frequency-bound scenarios, but overperforming in thread-bound scenarios. But that's also not new if that hypothetical part were to exist. Historically, most people in media, including us especially, have been pretty against buying the XQs when the non-XQs are present. So like 1600 versus the X, 2600 versus the X, you always got really good value with the non-XQ. AMD has decided to just consolidate that into one line. Uh, that kind of makes sense, the consolidation that is. Whether or not the price creep is justified will be up to testing. We're not even going to talk about whether or not it's, it's worth it or valuable today. That's for testing to determine. From initial on-paper specs, though, it does look reasonable. It's not a massive jump, so that's the good news. As for the naming scheme, if you're curious about that, it's pretty simple. AMD has moved to the 5000 naming for one reason, which is that it made a mess of the 4000 naming scheme, and it knows it. So there are currently 4000 series APUs. There are OEM-only CPUs. There are mobile and laptop CPUs, and it's just skipping that naming altogether with these desktop enthusiast parts to avoid confusing everybody. So until AMD releases an AMD R9 59505XEG XT CPU, we're not really going to complain about a naming scheme that's designed to reduce confusion. So that's the reason for the naming, nothing crazy there. Architecture, up next. This is actually the most interesting section. We don't have a full architecture day detail yet, but we're hoping to get that from AMD at some point soon. For now, we can get started with the critical basics. There are several significant changes with the Ryzen 5000 series versus the previous uh, Zen 2 CPUs. And first off, it is still a chiplet design. Uh, this hasn't gone back to a monolithic approach. The I.O. die also critically is exactly the same as before. So everything that we all know from the existing I.O. die from the Ryzen 3000 series will carry over to the Ryzen 5000 series. That really simplifies things in terms of figuring out what has changed. For the new stuff, or actually for, for the I.O. die, just an example if you're not aware, PCIe compatibility, USB support, stuff like that. That's what will carry over. Uh, there is still a maximum of three chiplets per piece per substrate. So you get three pieces of silicon per substrate maximally for the desktop parts anyway, non-threader for parts. For a 5950X, that would use all three chiplets. And there's still seven nanometer, but some of the internal structure has changed. And this is the important part. AMD has changed its core complex to unify into an eight core 32 megabyte L3 cache structure. Zen 2 was previously running four plus four configurations with half the cache available on each CCX, which is what prompted better performance on the 3300X versus the 3100X when you match them to the same clock speeds. In that scenario, you were looking at a four plus zero instead of a two plus two config, uh, which had benefits to performance if you were on four plus zero instead. AMD indicated that core to core communication will improve and that core to cache performance will improve with its Ryzen 5000 CPUs. There are also latency benefits to consolidating the design and effective improvements in memory latency. In the block diagram that AMD provided, this layout is made clear. Zen 3 is moving to a unified 32 megabytes L3 cache, which should have benefits for access speed and theoretically reduce cache misses, but we need more architecture insight before talking about this further. As for where positionally Zen 3 is, AMD noted that it views Zen 3 as a new architecture, whereas it would view Zen 2 or classify Zen 2 as a derivative architecture of the predecessors. So this is, in a sense, going to be a paradigm shift for how AMD is handling the uh, internal, the inner workings of the CPUs, it should be a more major change in performance as a result, hence the IPC claims that AMD is making that we'll talk about shortly. And uh, we'll, we'll ultimately have a lot of testing to do on this to look at the new behaviors of the CPUs. AMD called this a front to back redesign. And it also noted that one CCD will now be equal to one CCX in the sense that it will contain one CCX up to a total count of eight cores per CCD. 
So with the 5950X, again, you're going to have two CCDs active. That gives you your 16 cores. This has implications that would theoretically drastically improve gaming performance uh, over predecessors, and which AMD claims will allow it to claim the best gaming performance crown from Intel, which Intel has long held as sort of a, a last chance, a foothold or a stronghold in performance metrics in reviews against AMD CPUs. Because although Intel still leads in some workstation applications and anything that's been thread bound, AMD has been slowly creeping ahead and passing Intel in scenarios we previously didn't expect, like Adobe Premiere, for example. Uh, so this is going to be a, a, it will have major implications for Intel, its marketing and its design teams to try and claim back that stronghold and make sure it hands on to it. Back to the design choices, though, power was a major talking point for AMD with its Zen 3 parts. AMD provided the following quote to Gamers Nexus. It reads, quote, another point we wanted to make is taking system wall power at full load versus performance delivered. We continue to advance our performance per watt story. The new Ryzen products with Zen 3 do not increase their power consumption at all. We're talking 24% improvement in performance per watt from Zen 2 versus Zen 3 with no change in socket power, no change in TDP. We're extracting better efficiency simply through better architecture and better design methodology. We haven't touched the power variable in this at all. And end quote on that. As for TDP, back to our own writing, the numbers in this slide uh, earlier showed 105 watt TDP for most parts. If you look at the 5600X though, it's the only one at 65 watts right now. Just to remind everyone, TDP is not really the full picture and is mostly architected to help OEMs with their own design policies, uh, with marketing a bit, and to some extent to help customers get an idea of where things are, but you need to look at actual power consumption numbers if you want to know actual power consumption, even though there's a W at the end of it. We'll put the formula for TDP on the screen though. And if you care to learn more, we have a deep dive on exactly this topic uh, and the formula is unchanged and therefore the deep dive is unchanged. The formula, if you care, is TDP in watts equals TK degrees Celsius minus T ambient or temperature ambient degrees Celsius divided by heat sink fan theta CA. And we again talk about that in the other piece. Power tends to run higher than the TDP number you get, but the important part is that AMD says the power should be equal with previous products in the same lineup. For example, we would expect, based on what AMD has said, that the 5900X would equate to the 3900X roughly in power consumption uh, while yielding higher performance. So that's the key takeaway. As for memory, JetX support is still 3200 officially, with OC support similar to the 3000 series CPUs. Liquid nitrogen results sound promising at present, while more standard overclocking on air and water should be expected to be limited or similar to the previous generation. AMD told us that fabric clocking remains the highest return on time investment and noted that memory compatibility is similar to the Ryzen 3000 series. It explicitly noted that the memory controller remains the same on the 5000 series CPUs, the I.O. die is identical, and that what we know of memory overclocking from 3000 CPUs as in the desktop ones, should translate mostly linearly to the 5000 series. AMD further stated that there may be a slight reduction in overclocking headroom or gains as a result in changes to the CCXs, but that it is otherwise similar in functionality and behaviors to before. And we'll run a separate piece as well on AMD architecture as we collect more information. This is a topic we'll be trying to get more info on. Typically, these companies will do what they call an architecture day where they get actual architects or at least people working very closely with architects to go through the pivotal changes in architecture or process or whatever the changes may be uh, with media. So we're hoping for one of those. If we get one of those, we'll run a, an architecture piece similar to the one we did for the RTX 3000 series recently, where it just purely looks at what makes this work, what drives the changes. 400 and 500 series motherboards up next and stock cooler inclusion. So AMD has made a big deal out of its multi-generational support within a motherboard socket since before Ryzen. If you remember AM3, AM2 and everything else. In messaging from AMD to Gamers Nexus, we learned that the Ryzen 5000 series CPUs will be supported in the X570 and B550 motherboards. There's already BIOS rollout for that. There is support for 400 series boards planned like B450 and X470 as coming out in a beta format in January of 2021. So if you want to prepare your board for newer CPUs, the uh, AGISA version that you need to look for is 1080, so 1080 
and newer for supporting Zen 3 CPUs. The BIOS package has been getting rolled out already for a few months now. There's a good chance your motherboard already has one if you want to plan for updating for it. And we generally advise, though, that you don't update your BIOS before you have both CPUs in hand, just in case it drops support for the older one so that you're still able to use the computer. Uh, and also, make sure you check the CPU support list on the motherboard site. We asked the AMD whether older CPUs would get dropped from the support table for 400 series motherboards pursuant to previous content pieces about the B550 motherboard support and fractured BIOS concerns. AMD said that it will vary from vendor to vendor, but stated that it had done a back-end cleanup of GISA code to free up space to support more CPUs when BIOS updates come out. AMD also informed us that it provides a menu of options to board vendors who can then pick which CPUs they want to support based on the board's audience. As such, if you're updating a 400 series board, you should check the CPU support list to confirm prior to purchasing a 5000 series CPU upgrade whether it'll be supported. The 500 series boards are simpler and should all be supported from what we understand, but it's still good policy to check the supported CPU list. As for 300 series boards, AMD was already fairly public about this in the past, but right now the answer is a firm no. We're not going to support those with the 5000 series CPUs. AMD will not be officially providing support for 300 series boards. It's possible at some point someone release, releases a hacked BIOS if they really want to keep the boards alive. We would advise caution if you do want to use a hacked BIOS on an older board for a number of reasons. Like one is it could break the board if it's not done correctly and not an official BIOS. But the other one too is that a lot of those X370 boards by today's standards were really not done that well. Uh, some of them were pretty good for the time, but also as VRM requirements have increased, as memory topology has uh, become more advanced with the newer boards, you may lose out on some performance if you were even able to hack one to support it. So keep all of that in mind. We next asked the AMD about its stock cooler plans. The company will be including a Wraith cooler of some variant with the 65 watt and below CPU SKUs. We haven't been able to confirm yet which exact one it is, but we were informed that this uh, should not be a new cooler, just one of the existing ones coming out with the 5600X and other 65 watt or below TDPs if they are to come out later. The higher end parts will not include a cooler from what AMD was telling us in uh, emails shortly after the announcement. And we're fine with this decision as we've recommended aftermarket cooling solutions for the 12 core and the eight core parts for at least a generation now. So if anything, it's just reduced waste in the box anyway, since they're not particularly high performing for those parts. Finally, we get to the section of the news that has stars and asterisks around it because it's first party performance claims from AMD. We typically try not to present too many of these numbers from first parties prior to a product coming out. We're going to do the same here and just show uh, one or two slides and, and limit it to that. You'll have to check back for reviews for the rest of it because uh, we prefer obviously independent verification. But it's good to have an idea of what they're claiming. So. Uh, AMD currently is claiming a 19% aggregate IPC uplift over Zen 2. That's its major claim here. And if we pull up a couple of slides, AMD's presentation noted a 25 workload average of clock for clock comparisons between two 8 core parts, and those are both set to 4 gigahertz. Averaged against this set of workloads and from its own internal testing, AMD claims that the 19% uplift is resultant primarily of CCX changes, cache prefetching, uh, execution engine changes, branch prediction changes, and a few others that are listed on their slide. AMD takes one major dig at the 10900K and claims an efficiency increase of 2.8x, but that's something we'll determine for ourselves in independent reviews. Finally, in its initial game slide presented, AMD claims a 21% uplift in League of Legends over the 10900K, and LOL is a heavily CPU-bound game, so that's more noteworthy than perhaps some of these others. It also saw a 19% uplift in CSGO, same story there. These will offset the average towards the high side, but are major grounds of victory if accurate, where AMD previously uh, seriously struggled to match Intel, although it has caught up in the 3000 generation. Now it claims to be passing Intel. Most other games are within a few percentage points of each other. However, that's still a much larger full swing. So again, keeping in mind that these are first party numbers just for sake of discussion, if you see a 5% or 3% uplift versus the Intel part, the reason that means a little bit more than 5% or 3% is because it's coming from a disadvantaged position, not equal footing. Uh, so that is a, a larger change than perhaps the marketing slide makes it look. 
which is odd. <laughs> Normally, companies don't do it that way. So good on AMD for making a marketing slide that, at least as of right now, with the information we have now, is not complete BS. Hopefully, uh, everybody can stick to the uh, claims performance slides similar to this and, and like not completely blow out the scale and make it utterly pointless to even look at. So good job, AMD, on that one. Really surprised to see that uh, because normally it would be presented as not 3 to 5% better than the competitor, but like 30% improved or whatever, however you can stretch the numbers to make it sound bigger than it might be. Uh, so that was a, a, a refreshing slide to see. Next one, though. We checked with AMD, and uh, also it's in the, the footnotes, the appendix of the slides that AMD presented. The company noted that its systems for this testing that we just showed were identical. It claims a 3600 megahertz configuration for memory. We contacted AMD and asked them to verify if that's just 3600 sticks set to auto or if they actually configured it to 3600. AMD tells us that they actually configured the uh, memory to 3600 megahertz on all test platforms, and it claims that the timings were at least somewhat controlled. Uh, it also said 2080 Ti's were used for both systems. Coolers were identical, all that stuff. And, and then again, we'll give you performance numbers once we have the parts anyway. So obviously, we'd recommend waiting for third-party benchmarks. Those should be out sometime around November 5th, uh, if not slightly before, depending on the launch scheduling. The news announcement as of now mostly condenses down to what we've reported here. If there's additional information that comes out in the near future, we'll be sure to put something together on it. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll be testing shortly. We will probably be refreshing some of our CPU test suite with a fresh set of numbers for the most relevant parts for comparison. And we'll be back soon with more information on this. AMD also has some RDNA 2 announcements later this month. It had one or two slides that we're not going to bother showing, but you can go find them if you want. One or two slides showing initial RDNA 2 performance of one of its GPUs. Uh, it was not shown against anything, and it was just three games. So we're going to leave that out, but uh, the company is preparing, obviously, for both devices to launch. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. As always, there is an article linked in the description below if you'd like the written recap of this. It might publish on a, a the one or two hour delay after the video. And you can go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. We'll see you all next time.